Historic Assence award-winning work at Clactolve Rock in association with AOC Archaeology is the largest built heritage project within the Call Landscape Partnership. And we are immensely thankful to all of our funders for their support and you can see them all listed there. Our work began in 2006, as you can see there, and culminated in the present project, which has been running from 2017 to this year. The overall aim of which is to conserve, excavate, present and interpret the Brock. And the priorities for each year of the project are listed there. The Scottish Iron Age runs from 700 BC through to 500 AD. But rock building seems to be restricted very largely to the late 4th century BC. Rocks are complicated, sophisticated, ingenious structures. They need experts to be involved to build them, and therefore not everybody was in a position to be able to draw in that expertise. There's an inner wall, which is a vertical cylinder of dry stone, an outer wall, also made of dry stone, and the wall tapers and leans in. There are voids over all of the entrances to relieve weight, and there are scarce ledges for the floors. Here is Clactol before we started work. The walls of the rock emerging out of a pile of rubble, and those walls collapsing outwards and inwards. The whole of the entrance area clogged with stone and the interior full of rubble as well. That rubble in the interior was pushing the walls outward and visitors clambering over the brock and walking round the top edges of the walls were also loosening stones and pushing those off. So gradually the brock was becoming more unstable. The first work that we needed to undertake in 2017 was the arduous process of removing all of that rubble from the interior, 275 tonnes of it, done by a small team of professionals and volunteers working for several weeks just to clear the stone. However, eventually we came down to what we suspected, uh, an area suggesting burning, charcoal rich deposits scattered right the way across the surface of the brock. And here are some of the things that we found within that charcoal rich layer. Char charred grain and charred matting or roofing or partition uh, material. Uh, these were scattered all over the area. And within that deposit, we also began to find pieces of pottery, uh, pieces of stone uh, lamp, and also some ironwork. One of the more interesting and certainly the largest single find was this knocking stone used as a mortar for crushing the grain before it's transferred to a quern to be turned into flour. It was so full of charred grain that it suggested that somebody had been working on it on the day of the fire and just run out and left it. Here's the excavation in process with a series of the things that we were beginning to identify. The hearth in the centre with a tank to its right, quern stones lying at various places around the interior of the rock, the knocking stone uh, within a clay layer over paving, and then also we began to find evidence of a souterrain, a cellar area, uh, which is in the bottom left. And from there, the floor rises well over a metre to the highest part of the floor, which is over on the top right. Here's the hearth after we've cleared uh, it very much further back. You can see that the hearth stone itself is very uh, fire damaged. You can also see that there's a sort of curb running round and that the water tank is contained within that curbed area. You can see the knocking stone and to its right the souterrain. 
and this is the suzerain having been cleared out completely. By the time we'd finished work in 2017, the whole of the interior had been cleared, as you can see there, and there's also another photograph taken from exactly the same spot of what it was like when we began to show the contrast. Alongside the excavation work, there was conservation going on. This section of outer walling was in danger of collapse because the lower stones had all fallen out. So it was completely dismantled, a concrete plinth put in place, and then the stones reinstated in exactly their original positions above. Most of the lintels in the rock were broken or they were unstable in the sense that the walling on either side had moved and so they were in danger of falling. So with most of the uh, lintels, new uh, metal bars have been put in place in order to secure them. Some work we were unable to complete in 2017. We began work on clearing the entranceway but didn't finish it and we didn't even start on the conservation and stabilization of the walling uh, to the left of the triangular lintel below the dog and further left again. That had to wait until the next year. We returned to deal with those issues in 2018 and there you can see the entrance area with its conserved walling to the left of the triangular lintel. Uh, the discovery of an antechamber uh, just in front of that entrance and then also of a paved area running down towards the perimeter wall. We cleared out the chambers in the walls uh, and discovered that the rock originally had not chamber, separate chambers, but a single gallery running round a ground level, which was later changed into a series of individual chambers. And here you can see work by the end of 2018 with the whole of the paved area from the rock entrance right the way down to the perimeter wall cleared. Looking down on the rock now, after the excavation has taken place, you can see the curving pathway leading from the perimeter wall towards the interior, the cleared interior, uh, ready for the next phase of the work. But in the meantime, throughout the whole of the period from the moment the finds first began to uh, come out of the excavation, they needed cataloguing, analysing and conserving. And here are some of the conserved items. Uh, iron pins and adds, one of some 30 agricultural implements. Uh, in this slide you see a number of uh, features made out of bone and also yet another one of those agricultural things, a spade. Here we have a very fine weaving comb made out of antler and also a couple of other bone implements, a pin or an awl and a knife handle. And here, one of our more interesting finds, the pottery fragments we discovered would amount to something between a dozen and maybe 20 large pots. Uh, and most of them were decorated. That's not surprising, but what was surprising was to be able to find this bronze pin, which exactly fitted the decoration on one particular pot fragment, suggesting that it was the very pin that had been used by the potter. Defence seems to have been a feature of life in the Brock towards the end of its life, certainly. And here we've got a dagger pommel, a more unusual find. Also fairly unusual, particularly on a coastal site, woven animal fibres, perhaps from a highland cow. So we could come to some tentative conclusions by this stage. The Brock may have begun 
uh, uh, begun its life as an elite structure built in the 4th century and pushing building techniques to their absolute limit, but there was at least one collapse, probably several, rebuilds, abandonments, reoccupations, and a final occupation from 50 BC to 50 AD, ending with the fire and collapse. And all of the finds that we came across came from that final occupation. And by this stage, the status of the site seems to have gone down a bit, and it is basically just a family farm of that period. We've already touched on the access uh, through the perimeter wall and up to and through the original entrance into the central area. Uh, eventually, you will be able to climb the original stairs to a new viewing platform, and that's been built at wall head height on the seaward side, giving a full view of the brock and also over the brock to the landscape beyond. There'll be a small panel of basic information on that viewing platform, but the vast majority of much more detailed information will be on panels, and there'll also be replica finds, some of which are there on the right, installed in a new interpretation building at Clacktoll. We've got a new website. We're planning a popular book. There will be full professional reports, and we are already conducting guided tours during the tourist season, COVID allowing. Public involvement has been an important part of the project from the very beginning. Uh, there were members of the public, locals and visitors alike, involved in the excavation, in the finds cataloguing. Uh, there are a few uh, farmers, Iron Age farmers from Ulpool High School. Um, and all the time that we were doing the excavation work, there was a constant stream of visitors coming to find out what we were doing. We also held particular workshops. Uh, in the top left, you can see a number of people making pots in an Iron Age style. Uh, this was ably assisted by two local potters. And we then uh, had them fired in a pit and put on an evening event uh, where there was Iron Age food, where the pit was opened, the pots were taken out, um, and there were also a whole series of other activities uh, which could illustrate Iron Age life, including seeing how far you get trying to grind flour using the sort of quernstone that we had found in the broch. Other projects and ours also coincided to a certain extent. The Artist in Residence project produced uh, a full set of marvellous uh, bronze plaques uh, designed and made in part by local people and then cast in bronze and those have now been installed on the approaches to the rock from both south and north. The Ascent Crofters Trust were having an anniversary celebration while we were working on the site and one of the things that they'd organised was a drumming workshop which was actually held inside the excavated broch uh, and that certainly made quite a difference in terms of the acoustic effect. We'd like to end by saying a very big thank you to the Koyak and Ascent Living Landscape Partners because Historic Ascent on its own as a purely voluntary organisation would have been very hard pressed to be able to mount such a large and important excavation and consolidation program uh, without the administrative, moral and financial support of the overall partnership.